and I welcome you here this morning. This is new for all of us. This is the first time that we've had our Sunday services up here in the Great Hall. So thank you for your patience. Thank you for your patience yesterday while we were getting accommodation sorted out. There's a, a lot of new things for us to all cope with, but it's just a delight to stand here and see you all and to see new faces. We've had our welcome meeting and a number of new faces at the conference this year. That's been a delight. Good to see old faces, old in the nicest possible way, that is. Uh, and it's good to be together to worship the Lord. My name's Jeremy Bailey. I'm the chair of the conference committee. Uh, there are many of us who come together every year to organize and run this conference. Uh, I happen to be the chair of that committee, and I'm very thankful for prayers and for all the help. Just one quick announcement, that is, if there should be an emergency, a fire, then you will be told what to do from the front. And that's all we need to know. You won't be told by me, but you'll be told by somebody who knows what they're talking about. Uh, but we thank the Lord that in all the years that we've been here, uh, we've not had emergencies. We've come to worship the Lord together. I want to read Psalm 24. The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof, the world and those who dwell therein. For he has founded it upon the seas and established it upon the rivers. Who shall ascend the hill of the Lord? And who shall stand in his holy place? He who has clean hands and a pure heart, who does not lift up his soul to what is false, and does not swear deceitfully, he will receive blessing from the Lord and righteousness from the God of his salvation. Such is the generation of those who seek him, who seek the face of the God of Jacob. Lift up your heads, O gates, and be lifted up, O ancient doors, that the King of glory may come in. Who is this King of glory? The Lord, strong and mighty, the Lord, mighty in battle. Lift up your heads, O gates, and lift them up, O ancient doors, that the King of glory may come in. Who is this King of glory? The Lord of hosts. He is the King of glory. And so we come to worship our God and to Lord Jesus Christ, our Lord and King of glory, as we sing our opening hymn. It is that great hymn based upon Mary's song, Tell Out My Soul, Greatness of the Lord. If you are having a, a book to read from, it's number 35. And it will appear on our screen, Tell Out My Soul, The Greatness of the Lord. Shall we stand and sing?
Shall we draw near to God in prayer? Let us all pray. Almighty and everlasting God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, we draw near to you this morning in the sure and certain hope of eternal life in Jesus Christ our Lord, to know that we come to you and can address you as our Father in heaven, not because of our own personal righteousness, of which we have none, but because of the grace and mercy of the Lord Jesus and of his righteousness. Oh, we thank you that we can come and tell the greatness of the Lord this morning. We want to tell the greatness of our God in creation, that you are a God who has made the heavens and the earth and everything that dwells in them, that you have given each one of us life and breath and everything else. You are a God of richness, a God of power, God of great wisdom, and all these things are seen in the creation. All things that are made, praise your holy name. And Lord, we come to you also to tell of the greatness of your love to us in salvation, that we sinners have known the grace of God, that you sent your Son to be the Savior of the world, and we praise you this morning that so many of us here this day can say that he has saved us, that we are here today as redeemed sinners. The price has been paid for us on Calvary's cross. The blood has been shed for us on that cross, the blood that alone can make sinners clean, the blood alone that can atone for our sins. Oh, we pray, Heavenly Father, that this day might be a day of gospel proclamation, not only here, but we think of all those churches that we know, that we represent, our own home churches, where your word will be preached today and your people will gather together. We ask that it might be a day of great gospel proclamation, for we live in days of good news where we may proclaim the good news of Christ to all. That is your command, the command of the risen Lord Jesus Christ to go into all the world and to make disciples of all creatures. Oh, Father, we pray that that gospel work might go on today in the power of the Holy Spirit to the salvation of souls and the building up of believers. We praise you for the greatness of of salvation and we praise you for the greatness of your word that you have spoken to us we thank you that in many ways you've spoken to us through the prophets but we praise you for the greatest way of all that you've spoken in your son and we rejoice today in him father we thank you for keeping us to this day we thank you for another year so many of us can say that you have been good to us you have kept us through another year. You brought us together. Thank you for renewal of friendship and fellowship here at the conference. And we pray that we might make new friends also. We pray, Lord, that you would be present with us. Our conference is nothing at all if you are not present, if you are not at work. And so we pray that your word might be open today and in the coming days, and that your Holy Spirit will be pleased to take that word and apply it to our hearts. Lord, we ask for that. We don't just ask for your word to enter our minds to inform us. We pray that your word would enter our hearts, that we might embrace it, and we might know it, and we might believe it. And we pray that your word would then affect our will, so that we might be changed through your word, through the power of your spirit, we might be something other than what we were when we arrived, that you would do a mighty work, save those who are at the present outside of your kingdom, we pray, and build us up and conform us more to the likeness of your dear son whom we love. So we pray, Lord, that you would draw near to us today and we ask that you would forgive our many sins. We do pray for your children who are in 
hard situations. We pray for those who are going through trials. Pray for those who are concerned about loved ones. We pray for those who are enduring sickness. We pray for those who are in old age and frail. We pray for those, Lord, that are facing particular and peculiar temptations. Pray for the young ones also. We thank you for the Sunday school that is going on now and we thank you for the youth meetings that will go on through the, through the week and we pray for a new generation that will grow up to know the Lord. We pray, Father, that you might be at work. Hear our prayers, for we bring them in the only name that is acceptable, the name of our Lord and Saviour, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. We sing once again to the praise of God. Uh, our next hymn is, I Will Glory in My Redeemer. If you're using the books, it's in the supplement, and it's number 10. I Will Glory in My Redeemer. Well, my name is uh, Mark Barnes, and it's my job at each service to remind you of what's happening each day and to help you to get the most out of the conference. Uh, as you may know, uh, there are many people who want to be in their own churches today, so the, the conference proper doesn't really begin until tomorrow evening, uh, but that doesn't mean at all that there's uh, nothing to let you know about. There are still things happening today. Uh, if you're a young adult, and I'll leave it to you to decide whether or not you fit into that category, uh, then one of our fellowship groups uh, for young adults, Take Time, are going on a walk this afternoon. And if you'd like to join them, uh, meet outside Medris at 3 o'clock. Uh, then at 3.30, we'll have the first of our uh, evangelistic open-air meetings down on the promenade opposite the Marine Hotel. If you'd like to come to support that meeting, you'd be very welcome. 
Uh, then this evening at, at 6.30, we're back here in the Great Hall for our evening service where Adrian Brake will be preaching to us. Uh, that's going to be followed by those fellowship groups that I mentioned earlier for young adults and for those aged 16 to 21. If you haven't already got plans for tomorrow, you may like to join our history trip to Blyne Anach and Newcastle Emlyn. Uh, that trip leaves uh, the Porter's Lodge here on the campus at 9 a.m. and then picks up at the Marine Hotel on the seafront at 9.15. Uh, the trip costs £15, and there are still a few spaces left, uh, but you do need to book if you intend to go. So if you'd like to go on that trip and haven't already booked, uh, then have a word with Jeremy after the service, uh, or Chris, who uh, works in the office, and they'll get you booked in. They'll be standing uh, just at the side of the stage here after the service. Now, as it's the uh, first meeting of the week, there are uh, one or two things I do need to uh, remind you about. The first thing is to simply say that we're here to help. And if you've got any questions or any difficulties or problems, uh, say with your accommodation or you're not sure where things are, something like that, uh, do come and talk to us. Uh, just outside the Great Hall here uh, is a welcome desk that will be open from uh, tomorrow, and that can perhaps be your first uh, port of call. Uh, but in the meantime, if you've got any queries, you could either speak to Jeremy, uh, or if there's a, a queue for him, uh, any of the stewards uh, wearing their yellow t-shirt should be able uh, to help you. Uh, the second thing is uh, that as it's a, a Sunday today, you don't need badges to get into the, the meetings today, uh, but you will need them for the rest of the meetings um, during the week. You'll need your, your badge uh, like this. Now, uh, should you lose your badge, uh, or you go to the meeting and find that you've left your badge in your flat, that can be very frustrating. I've got to go all the way back to my room to, to get it. Uh, but don't, don't panic. Uh, you don't need to try and uh, sneak into the Great Hall through one of the fire exits. It has been known. You don't need to do that. You don't need to find somebody large to hide behind uh, so a steward doesn't spot you. If you forget a badge uh, from tomorrow, just go to the welcome desk, let them know who you are, and hopefully they'll be able to, to help you out. But we don't want anyone feeling they've got to go all the way back to their accommodation uh, just to get their badge. That's all I've got for uh, this morning. Uh, back to Jeremy. Thank you. Thank you. I think at this point I'm going to ask James to come and speak to us. James Sircom uh, has got a couple of roles this year, but there's some things he wants to tell us about. He might want to tell us about those and take them with him. Thank you. Okay, you're welcome. Thanks, James. I can, uh, I can gladly do that, Jeremy. Uh, thank you. Good morning. It's good that you've come. Thank you so much for all you dads, mums, grannies, and children of all ages. We're so pleased that you've taken the trouble to book and to come and to join us for worship with all the constraints on holiday time and finances. We're so pleased that you've committed to come and uh, we want to help you make the most of the week. We want the children to be seen and not heard. We especially don't want them to be not seen and not heard. So you can find out all about the, the three supergroups that are going on that run each morning from 10.45 while the morning services. You can read about them in page 14 and 15 on your conference guide. You've got the, the Tiny Tots, the Holiday Heroes and Jabba, all organized with teams of excellent volunteers. But alongside that, we've got some new activities for the families this year. The first of those is a picnic in the park. Now, that'll be on Tuesday. So it'll be between 1 and 3 in the afternoon, behind St. Mike's Church at the end of the promenade. So if you're parents with little children, you bring your lunch, bring your sandwiches and your fizzy pop and your healthy snacks, do come along. Uh, It'll be don't forget the children, it'd be lovely to see you there. Now, all parents know that storytelling is a, is a wonder. And we as Christians, we really have the best stories to tell, haven't we? Don't we? Now, we have something else especially for you little ones this week. So often we come to the evening service and you've got a, you've got a dad or a mum back in the flat with five children and, and there's no hope of live streaming because they've got bath time and story time to do. Uh, so rather than them just be left in their flats and God bless you, uh, 
We've got a storytelling session on Wednesday evening, and that's up at Ferrum Pen Glice, where you registered, at Buthin, where you registered. As for parents and preschoolers, six to half past six on Wednesday, and then from half past six to seven, those uh, parents with infants and uh, maybe some juniors as well. Uh, do bring uh, the little ones with you, and if they want to come in their jammies and bring their favourite toy and they've got their blankie, that's fine. Come along. It'll be lovely to see them and you there. And then thirdly, again, new this year, on Friday morning, we have a short Thanksgiving service in here between half nine and ten-ish. Just a short service at the Great Hall to give thanks for the work that's going on with the children. It'll be geared towards the young families, so the singing will be the songs that they sing in their clubs. It'll be an opportunity to hear what they've been learning and for them to tell us what they've enjoyed this week, for us to, to pray and to thank God for the families and the little ones who've come. You're very welcome to come. Be to all invited between uh, uh, 9.30 and just after 10. So don't panic. You don't need to get down here thinking, I've got a bagsy my seat because I always sit in that seat over there. It'll be open and welcome to everyone, but it'll be geared towards the families. And then uh, if uh, that's your thing and you'd like to support and, and be encouraged and pray for them, do come along. If uh, you want that extra quarter of an hour in your flat, uh, that's okay. There'll be plenty of time for you all to come in and not be late. We've got some letters that are letters for parents and you're used to letters in school. So we've got some of this detail on paper for you to find as well. Come and find me uh, out the back at the end of the service. Thank you. Thanks, James. Good to see you, James. Thank you. We're going to take up an offering now for the work of the Evangelical Movement of Wales. Uh, don't worry if you haven't come prepared for this, uh, but we generally do in our Sunday services, we take up an offering in the morning and in the evening services. We also take up a, a special offering on the Thursday morning of our conference, again for the work of the Evangelical Movement. We'll be hearing something of that work during the week so you can see how the Lord has led and provided uh, through your kindness and his goodness over the year. So we will sing number 501, which is Oh How the Grace of God. If you've got books 501, Oh How the Grace of God, and we'll take up our offering. Um, I don't know whether it's easier to stand or sit. I think we'll stand, because it's good to stand and sing, isn't it? But we'll have our offering taken. Thank you.
Let's just give thanks, shall we? Heavenly Father, it's right and proper that we, your children, should give thanks to you for every good and every perfect gift that comes from you. We recognize that all that we have comes from you. All that we are is yours. We pray that these gifts might be used for your glory and honor for the work of the evangelical movement. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. One of the things that I've been very aware of over the years is the amount of prayer that is offered for this conference and for our speakers, and we greatly are thankful to the Lord for that and for all who pray. I was really encouraged this morning to open up a prayer diary from the Slavic Gospel Association and to discover that the entry is for our conference and asking that uh, people would pray for us. And so I know there are a lot of people praying for us uh, all over the world. Some of you have come from many different parts of, of the world. met someone this morning who's come from Singapore. And I uh, don't know if anyone's come further than that, but maybe you have. We're greatly appreciative of that. Our speaker this morning has had a bit of a journey. He's on holiday. And so because of that, we're, we're greatly thankful to him for accepting the invitation to come and to speak. He's on holiday down in Pembrokeshire. Um, and on the map, it doesn't look very far, but as many of us find in Wales, distances on maps are nothing. It's when you get in the car and start driving, it always takes twice as long as it would anywhere else in the world than uh, to, to get anywhere. So we're very grateful for him, especially as he came on his scooter this morning, uh, having left his car with his wife there. We're really thankful to have Pete Greasley with us. Thanks, Pete, for coming. Really Thank appreciate you. you being here. Um, Pete is... a uh, the pastor in Christ Church in Newport, and he's been there for many, many years since the church's beginning. And we are so thankful for him, for the ministry that God has given him. And he's going to preach to us shortly. Um, he's going to do his own Bible reading after we've had our next hymn, uh, and then he's going to bring God's word. So let's just pray for him uh, as we come together now. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you that your word is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword. And we thank you that you have entrusted your word to us. We thank you for preachers, and we thank you especially for our brother this morning. We thank you for bringing him here amongst us, and we pray that he might know the great help of your Holy Spirit as he brings your word to us shortly. We ask that we might be good hearers of your word, but not mere hearers. Grant that we might be doers of your word also. And to you be all the glory in Jesus' name. Amen. Now our next hymn, it's, if you've got a book, it's number 600. Uh, it's a great hymn. Many of us have come to love this hymn. Uh, it is, speaks about the Lord Jesus Christ, the great Messiah. Uh, it is finished, the Messiah dies. So it uh, speaks about the death of our Lord Jesus Christ and his uh, greatness in that. It is finished, the Messiah dies, cut off for sins, but not his own. Let's focus upon the greatness of of the sacrifice of our Saviour as we stand and sing, "'Tis finished, the Messiah dies."
Good morning. Can you hear me at the back? Thank you. That only, only someone halfway up said that. Good morning. It is a pleasure to be with you. Thank you so much for the invitation. I apologize up front. I, I've, I have been here once before, so I might get things wrong. I may offend you. It's not my intention. Under the pure, all things are pure. You are commanded to forgive me if I say anything in any way that I don't. I have been here once before, five years ago. Some of you, I've spoken here before. Two words. You probably weren't aware of it, but you may have been aware of a fool here once. Five years ago, I was sitting up there, up in the gods. You get vertigo up there. You've probably been up there. And uh, my daughter was in New York. She was at university for a while in New York. And I I was here with a, a team of friends, colleagues, and I hadn't been able to get in touch with our Kate. And I was getting concerned, and it was days and up there, my phone buzzed, and I took it out. A hymn was going on, and I saw it was Kate. I was so excited. And I switched it on, and and as I switched it on, I shouted, hey, baby! (laughs) But as I did it, the hymn stopped here. (laughs) And up there, you you may have remembered somebody a number of years ago just shouting, hey, baby, and wondered, what is going on? That was me. Please forgive me. Now my phone is not brought into the meetings. Leave your phones behind because that may happen to you. Um, I do want to serve you. I have. I did come on my scooter this morning from Newport in Pembrokeshire. I thought it would be good, a good idea. By the time I got to Cardigan, I thought this is a dumb idea. <laughs> I, I was frozen stiff, but then the sun came out at Aber Iron, and all was good. Okay, now. Preachers probably don't normally do this, do they? When they first, when they hear, they just go straight to the. So, again, I'm, forgive me for that introduction. I always do that. We're going to get to the Word of God. You'll be pleased to know. If you have a Bible, and I trust you do, please turn, if you would, to Romans chapter 5. And I'm going to be reading from the ESV, essentially sound version, <laughs> save for a few bits. I bring you the greetings, by the way, of all those in Christchurch, Newport. They know I'm here. They are praying for me. They're particularly praying for you, knowing that I am here. Um, so, we are going to read. I am jumping into the middle of chapter 5 of Romans. And uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to read it, and then I'm going to pray, and then we're going to get straight into it. And we're reading from verse 12. And from verse 12, I am going to read down through to the end of the chapter. So, here we go. Let's pray. This is the word of the Lord. Therefore, just as sin came into the world through one man, and death through sin, and so death spread to all men because all sinned. For sin indeed was in the world before the law was given. But sin is not counted where there is no law. Yet... Death reigned from Adam to Moses, even over those whose sinning was not like the transgression of Adam, who was a type of the one who was to come. But the free gift is not like the trespass. For if many died through one man's trespass, much more have the grace of God and the free gift by the grace of that one man, Jesus Christ, abounded for many." And the free gift is not like the result of that one man's sin. For the judgment following one trespass brought condemnation, but the free gift following many trespasses brought justification. If because of one man's trespass, death reigned through that one man, much more will those who receive the abundance of grace and the free gift of righteousness reign in life through the one man, Jesus Christ. Therefore, as one trespass led to condemnation for all men, so one act of righteousness leads to justification and life for all men. For as by the one man's disobedience, the many were made sinners, so by the one man's obedience, the many will be made righteous. Now the law came in, To increase the trespass. But where sin increased, grace abounded all the more. So that as sin reigned in death, grace 
also might reign through righteousness, leading to eternal life through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Let me just pray for a moment. Lord, I do ask for grace right now. Thank you for your word. Thank you for the glories that it portrays of your son, Jesus Christ. Father, I do ask that in my weakness you may help me serve these good people and that we may not just be affected in our minds as we read this. We may not just see things in it, but that you would take hold of our hearts, that you would thrill us again with the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. We may see again his glorious work on our behalf and revel in it. And as we revel in the joy of it, may you be glorified. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Somebody wrote this. Have you ever, perhaps late at night, perhaps early in the morning, felt the frightening weight and ugliness of your own sinfulness and had a sinking feeling in your stomach that if you died right then and there, you were not sure you would go to heaven, but perhaps be cast by a just and holy God into everlasting fire and from the presence of his glory. If you come to that place, and we all will at some time, what is it you will need to know to dispel your fears, still your heart, and bring you a real assurance of God's love and acceptance of you. The writer says this, you will need to know the triumph of sovereign grace. That's my title. Because that is what Paul is speaking to the Romans and God is speaking to us about here. The triumph of sovereign grace. John Piper says this about this, uh, about this passage here. He says, it is commonly agreed that Romans 5, 12 through 21 is among the most difficult passages in Romans, if not the entire New Testament. As a result, when we read this section, it is difficult to stay with the flow of thought. John Piper took seven messages on this. I'm going to do it in half an hour or so. And it's difficult to stay with the flow of thought. So you're going to have to give me your attention, guys. You're going to have to get your minds in gear and hold on and follow it through. Because as we do, I think God is going to bless us and help us and change us and cause us to rejoice in who he is. Paul is drawing together the initial part of his treatise on justification here in Romans chapter 5. Um, I don't want to teach my grandmother how to suck eggs. I'm sure you know this, but let me go through it again just so you know what's been happening up to now in Romans. Paul is writing to these Romans. He opens it up in chapter 1 in what, what is like a courtroom scene. And in the courtroom, you have God as the judge, and you have man in the dock. That's what's taking place in Romans 1 and Romans 2. And God is charging mankind with cosmic treason. And he explains that everyone is guilty. No one has sought God. No one gets away with this. The man calls the law into the, the witness dock. The, and the, the law comes in as a witness and he says, tell him how good I've been. And the law says, he's been worse than he thinks he is. And you find you go through chapter one and into chapter two. And in chapter three, halfway through, the, the sentence is pronounced. Guilty as charged. Created in the maker's image to glorify him. Yet we all, none of us, we, we fail to do that, and none of us is innocent. We are all guilty. And so it talks in Romans 3 about stopping the mouths of everyone. There is nothing left to say. Guilty as charged. Then you get this most glorious, magnificent verse, statement in Romans 3.21. One of the most glorious statements in the whole Bible. But now, there is a righteousness apart from the law, without what we do. A righteousness that is given by God 
through the Lord Jesus Christ, I'm paraphrasing. But now there is a righteousness. This staggering truth that God says, but in Christ, there is a righteousness that is imputed, is given apart from what we do. It is entirely, purely of grace. It is staggering as we are standing in the courtroom being accused and sentenced. And here's the sentence. It is placed upon Jesus Christ. That's where we've come so far. One to three is that. <coughs> Romans four, he then goes into Romans four because it's such a staggering statement in Romans 3.21. They can hardly believe it. So he goes to Abraham, the father of them, and he says, okay, hang on a minute. You don't believe this? Let me take you to Abraham. Abraham was justified by faith. He believed God and it was accredited to him as righteousness. What I'm saying is not a weird or a freaky thing. It has always been thus. And Abraham, Father Abraham, is the one you start with. So they're, oh my gracious. Oh my gracious, this has always been the case. And then in Romans 5, he wants to assure them of this glorious truth. And he's going to paint this magnificent picture of where they stand now in Christ. So what I want to do in this short time we have is compare and contrast Adam and Christ, where they are the same, where they are different, and what that means to us. We have two cosmic events in the Bible. One is in a garden, and the other is on a hill. The first cosmic event is the fall of man in Adam in the garden. The second cosmic event is the Son of God crucified on Golgotha. These two cosmic events make up the whole of mankind's story. Everything fits into these two events, and I want to show you that here this morning. We have two humanities, a humanity in Adam and a humanity in Christ, similar but different. So I've got three points. First point is when Adam fell, we fell. Second point is Christ is like Adam. And the third point is Christ is not like Adam. It's not complicated. It is glorious. So firstly, when Adam fell, so did we. We fell. The, our biggest problem as human beings... Our biggest problem is not our personal sins, but our personal standing. Let me explain that to you. It's, it, we go back to Genesis 3, into the garden where it all went wrong. Adam, the father of us all, our representative, he represents the whole of the human race. And as Adam is given this responsibility by God to be in his image, to rule in his stead, to represent him to the world and to represent mankind to him. In this relationship, when Adam rebels, when Adam rejects God, when Adam does the one thing, just the one thing that he should never do, it's all yours, except for this one thing. But Adam says, I want to be God. I want to be in charge of my own destiny. I want whatever I want. Adam falls. And you know the curse that comes on Adam. And because of his sin, death comes in. And their first, for Adam, his death is because of his sin. But everybody whom Adam represents now dies. We are part of Adam. There is an imputed sin from Adam into everybody that's ever born. God sees us in Adam. And the consequences of that are death. It is appointed for every man wants to die. And then comes the judgment. Through one man when he fell, we fell. Now, I'm laboring this, but it's important. When Adam fell in the garden, you were there. You were in Adam. When Adam sinned by 
by you being in him, by you being him representing mankind, you sinned, you fell as well. There's an imputed sin and consequences for Adam. We were in the garden. So he says this in verse 12. Through this act, verse 12, death spread to all men. Everybody is implicated, diseased, corrupted, tainted in our very genetic makeup, who we are. If you are born, you are born in Adam, of Adam, and what Adam did, you are associated with. Verse 13, he's making it clear. It's not just our breaking the law. This is what he's saying in verse 13. For sin indeed was in the world before the law was given. But sin is not counted where there is no, no law, yet death reigned from Adam to Moses, even over those whose sinning was not like the transgression of Adam, who was a type who was the one to come. It's not just our breaking the law. Death came in before the law arrived. Death reigned even though we may not have sinned like Adam. How did Adam sin? Adam, it says, transgressed. What does that mean? To transgress means to go off from what is right, from what you know to be right, what you've told to be right. So Adam is told, do not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Adam transgresses, and yet we still die, even though he's saying, before Moses there was no law to transgress, death was still the outcome. Why? Because you were in Adam when Adam fell. So the point is, people have died even though their individual sins against the law were not the reason for their death. He says here, they weren't counted. But verse 12, because all sinned. We all sinned not by imitation. That's what Pelagius talked about. Pelagius believed we were just born blank. And it was our decisions totally what we did. No, 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 no. Paul would say, no, you weren't born blank. You were born diseased. You were born guilty. You were born imputed with Adam's sin. Not by imitation, but by participation in Adam. And therefore, by replication. We actually act according to our very nature. We sin too. You still with me? Piper said it was complicated. It'll all get good in the end. <clears throat> Why is this? Well, he is our, what's called, federal head. Our representative, or even better, our presentative. So if you look through these scriptures and break it down, Paul's clear. Verse 15, many died through this one man's trespass. Verse 16, the judgment following one trespass brought condemnation for all. Verse 17, because of one man's trespass, death reigned through that one man. Verse 18, one trespass led to condemnation for all men. Verse 19, by one man's trespass, many were made sinners. So God sees everyone in Adam. That's why we are considered everybody that's ever lived, no matter how good you are or how good you think somebody is, we are, by our very nature of being, guilty of cosmic treason. We were in the garden. Here's a quote for you, if I can find it. I thought it would be good to start off with this quote, if I'm going to quote anybody. Martin Lloyd-Jones. He says this, God has always dealt with mankind through a head and representative. The whole story of the human race can be summed up in terms of what has happened because of Adam and what has happened and will yet happen because of Christ. So it answers the question that some people have. How can God condemn good people? Now we say, well, you're not good, and, but how do you define that? How can God condemn these so wonderful people who do such wonderful things? Because they're in Adam. Because they are guilty of cosmic treason. Because his sin was imputed to them. And what's more, they display it as well because we all do. We were in him in the garden. So God 
is legitimately, justfully, and rightfully angry with Adam. And he's angry with us in Adam. So, somebody, an ancient writer wrote this, O Adam, what hast thou done? For though it was thou that sinned, the evil is not fallen on thee alone, but upon all of us that come from thee. Paul says it this way in Ephesians 2 verse 3. We are, or we were, by very nature, children of wrath. God imputes the failure and sin of Adam to all humanity. There is no one who does good. No, not one, Paul says early on. We are enemies of God through Adam for all. That is the state of every person that's ever born. Had our first grandchild born a few weeks ago. And everybody says, he's, isn't, he's, look, he's perfect, isn't he? He's perfect. And obviously, as a grandfather for the first time, of course he's perfect. But I look at him and go, no, he isn't. Now, we're going to find that out pretty soon. In fact, we're already starting to find out he isn't perfect. But I know he isn't perfect. Why? Because he was born of the flesh. He was born of Adam. And he's in Adam. And he has the same response of God as God had to Adam legitimately and rightfully so. You think, it's not fair that God imputes Adam's sin to us. Oh, you, you want to hold off on that yet because you know where it's going. I'm going to go there anyway. But let's not shout, it's not fair. Let's hold on a minute. So secondly, Christ is like Adam. And that's what Paul wants us to see. Adam is... Uh, a type of Christ. He is the parallel of Christ. As we are in Adam, so we are now for those who believe, those who have received him, those who are in him. So as we are in Adam, so we are now in Christ, the last Adam. He is a type, the foreshadow of the one, verse 14, who is to come in Christ. So what we see happening in the garden with the imputation of Adam's sin to mankind, he is a type of Christ. It's pointing to a picture as well of a day that will come when another imputation will take place, when something else will happen. The premise is simple. Just as we are in Adam, in our humanity, in our nature, and therefore accounted sinners through his transgression, so in Christ we are now, by nature, accounted righteous through the perfect life and death of our new progenitor, the new beginning, beginner of our race which is essentially what the scripture talks about. A new race, a new humanity. That's why the virgin birth is so important because it's the end of one humanity and the beginning of another humanity. So Peter would say it this way, 2 Peter 2, 9, you are a chosen race. Paul would say in 2 Corinthians 5, if, if anyone is in Christ, this isn't metaphorical, this is literal. If anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Something has changed significantly and absolutely for those who have received Christ in the very nature of their being. You were by nature children of wrath, you are now by implication by nature not. Something has fundamentally changed. We divide people into so many ways, don't we? Men and women, adults and children, black and white, rich and poor, blah, blah, blah. God sees two kinds of people in the world. It's that simple. He sees those in Adam. He sees those in Christ. That's it. That's how he sees us. This is how God divides two humanities. So in verse 15... Talking about Christ now, the grace of that one man, Christ, abounded for many. Verse 16, the free gift of Jesus 
brought justification. Verse 17, the effect of Adam's sin brought death, but the effect of Christ's obedience means that we can now reign in life. Verse 18, one act, remember one act of disobedience leads to condemnation to all men. Now one act of righteousness leads to justification and life for all men. And verse 19, by one man, screams, oh no! What have you done? All of us that come from you now are guilty by imputation, guilty because we not just imitate, but we actually participate in that sin. Oh no. And then 2,000 years ago, another cry goes up It is finished. The two fundamental cosmic, cosmic situations that take place in this world. One's in the garden. One's on the cross. It is finished. Because of his perfect life and sacrificial death, overturned is what's taken place. God now, this is why I'm glad he imputes Adam's sin to all of us. Because the principle remains that through faith, he will impute Christ's righteousness to those who believe. It's how God deals with us. Christ is like Adam. They both stand and act as our representative. We'll come to that in a minute. But but he's not like him in the sense that Adam fell, Christ succeeded. For our sake, Paul says in 2 Corinthians... For our sake, he made him who knew no sin to be sin, so that in him we might literally become, through imputation, the righteousness of God. So, Christ is not like Adam, but Christ is like Adam. Final point. So, in verse 15, he says this, the free gift is not like the trespass. Now, we get into the juicy stuff. And in verse 16, the free gift is not like the result of one man's sin. So he's been saying, it is like this. And now he's going to go, it's the parallel. Now he's going to say, now it's the antithesis. It's not like this. It's not like this at all. Christ is like Adam. In a sense, Adam's a type, but he's not like Adam. Let me show you how he's not like Adam. They, yes, they both stand and act as our representative. That's why Christ had to be fully man. Only a man could stand as our representative. But Christ is the complete opposite and far more. He is not just the antithesis. He's the hyper antithesis, the hoopo antithesis, the staggeringly more so antithesis. You'll notice this in the way this is, in fact, all the way through chapter 5. You, you see this more, more than, much more. Verse 15, much more. Verse 17, much more. Verse 20, all the more. <coughs> He's going to talk about the abundance of grace here. See, this is it. One trespass, verse 16, leads to condemnation for all. One trespass. And yet, verse 20, and carrying on, verse 19, Christ's obedience is justification for many trespasses. Let me try and give you a picture. Do you remember 2010? Deep water horizon in the Gulf of Mexico, the BP oil rig. Remember that? Remember what happened with that? That there was a crack in the the pipe deep down. And 200 million gallons of crude oil pumped into the Gulf of Mexico. I mean, it just cost billions to try and sort out. And it cost, there was a fine to BP of $20 billion dollars as well, on top of the cleanup thing. It was horrific, absolutely horrific. If you read about it, they found out, essentially, it was, there were checks and balances that weren't 
in, 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 in them trying to keep an eye on it and the standard checks and balances that should have taken place didn't take place. But essentially it was one guy, one guy from one company who had one job to do and he failed to do that job and the checks and balances didn't check. So that a certain point part that should have been replaced wasn't replaced, it caused a weakness. And 200 million gallons of crude oil filled the Gulf of Mexico. One guy. Oh, no. What have you done? That's Adam's sin, but on a much greater scale. This is where Christ is not like Adam. The sinning is easy. It's the cleanup job. That is horror. Not, not actually doing your job so that cracking the pipe, that's no problem. Getting up 200 million gallons of crude oil, where do we start? Now, magnify it. Now, blow it up. Now, take it into the proportion of cosmic treason. Through one man's sin. Christ is not like Adam. He doesn't just make it right simply. Oh, I'll go to the cross. It'll be all right. No, 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 no. He has to take in himself. That's Gethsemane. Another garden. And he has to look into the cup of the horror, of the mess, of the wrath and the punishment and he looks into it. See, we sing about the cross. But we forget. We think it's just like Adam broke it, Christ mended it. No, no, no. He saw it all and took it upon himself and said, is there any other way? No, not my will, but yours. It's glorious. Paul wants us to feel this. God wants us to see this. This is much more. This is so much more. This isn't a simple cleanup job. This isn't like chemistry in school with pH levels. Seven was neutral, minus seven is acid or alkali, whatever it is, plus seven is acid or alkali, whatever it is, I can't remember. Oh, Adam went to minus seven, Jesus goes up to plus seven. No, 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 no. This is Adam's minus seven becomes the oil spill. And Jesus has to take the whole lot upon himself to get us not just back to seven, Back to neutral. No, no, no. Paul wants to say, no. What he does is he takes us way beyond it. Way, way beyond it. It's the time. I've got to keep going. I've got to move. He, he, he talks about this in verse 17. Let me read this. If because of one man's trespass, death reigned through that one man, much more will those who receive the abundance of grace and the free gift of righteousness reign in life through the one man, Jesus Christ. Do you know what that word abundance of grace means? It is a double superlative in the Greek. It's super incredibly, wonderfully, massively abounding. He cannot explain just what it took to clean it up. But it's grace that is it, that grace has to abound. How do I clean up this mess? The only thing that can do it is the super abounding grace of God. It's sovereign grace, John Piper says, because it conquers everything in its path. Think of, think of it like this. Yeah, he, he went, oh yes, I want to do what I want to do. The thing snaps. The mess is everywhere. God sends his perfect son, his only begotten son, who lives the perfect life and then drinks up the mess, takes the whole of it all, takes the sin upon himself 
and it conquers everything in its path. It is like a tsunami of grace. How much sin? This much sin. This much grace. How glorious is our Savior. Only he could have done this. It conquers everything in his past. He talks about the law coming in. There they do bring the law in again. Now the law came in, verse 20, to increase the trespass. But where sin increased, grace abounded all the more. So that as sin reigned in death, grace also might reign through righteousness, leading to eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. The law appears. This is the the absurdity of religion. The law appears not to clean up the mess. The law doesn't clean up the mess. The law's like taking a, a toilet roll to the Gulf of Mexico. All you do when you put the toilet roll on it is see how much oil it is. The law reveals the mess. The law says, do this, and you can't do it. And it shows you even more what a mess and how you are as well. I am not only in Adam because of my birth. I'm not in Adam because of my disease. I am in Adam because of the law. The law shows me that I am also a little Adam. Not only am I in him, he's in me. The law turns sin into active transgression. It makes us little Adams. The law says, now don't do this. And we do it. In fact, it increases sin. Because when it says, don't do it, Paul teaches us that it makes us want to do it all the more. The law comes in and shows us it's not unfair for God to impute Adam's sin to you. It's not unfair. Because you are him anyway. If you'd have been Adam, you'd have done it too. Proof. Here's the law. Transgression. There you go. You're a transgressor as well. It's in your very nature. It's your very choice. And yet in Christ, oh, his work is far superior. Through grace, Christ conquers Adam's transgressions and ours as well. His work, Paul is saying, is far superior. His work is magnificent. He doesn't just get us back to the garden. Oh, no, no, no. He takes us on to whole different places. Remember the hymn? In him, the tribes of Adam boast more blessings than their father lost. Cranfield says it this way. He says, that one single dismayed misdeed should be answered by judgment This is perfectly understandable. That the accumulated sin and guilt of all the ages should be answered by God's free gift. This is the miracle of miracles. Utterly beyond human comprehension. Paul's writing to the Romans and he's telling them there's something staggering and magnificent that God has done on behalf of them in Christ when we are legitimately declared guilty of cosmic treason and deserving death and hell. Apart from the law, a righteousness is given through the sacrificial death of his perfect and beloved son. Through faith, we can receive to ourselves and have that righteousness imputed to us and be free. It's staggering. And they're going, this is too good to be true. And he says, yeah, I know. Back to Abraham, chapter 4. Let me show you him. Oh, my gracious. But I'm not sure I can believe it. Let me tell you just how great this is. And by seeing how great it is, you see how great he is. Only the son could do this. When Adam's trespass meets Christ's grace on the cross, it is obliterated. And now we are not just back to the garden. Oh, no, no. We have so much more. We are no longer just representatives. 
We reign in life. What does that mean? We are sons and heirs together with him. We are not just representatives of the God who created Adam. No, no, no. Now in Christ, I now call you friends. Behold, what manner of love the Father has given to us that we should be called sons of God, adopted into his family, co-heirs with him. We're going through Hebrews at home. (coughs) And as we see what we are given, what is awaiting for us, the inheritance that is put aside for us, that is what is coming. Adam failed because he wanted more life, more knowledge, more power for himself. Christ triumphed because he emptied himself of all but love and died for Adam's helpless race. It is mercy all, immense and free for, oh my God, in September 1980, it found out me. Glorious, isn't it? That's why we're here. Stotty says this to finish. Nothing could sum up better the blessings of being in Christ than the expression, the reign of grace. For grace forgives sins through the cross and bestows on the sinner both righteousness and eternal life. Grace satisfies the thirsty soul and fills the hungry with good things. Grace sanctifies sinners, shaping them into the image of Christ. Grace perseveres even with the recalcitrant determining to complete what has begun and one day grace will destroy death and consummate the kingdom. So when we are are convinced that grace reigns, we will remember that God's throne is a throne of grace and we will come to it boldly to receive mercy and find grace for every need. And all this is through a glorious Savior, Jesus Christ our Lord. All of it. So what? So there is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. None. Why? He's cleaned it all up. It's finished. It's over. His grace is so much more. Am I in Adam? Yes. Am I still aware of being in Adam? Yes. Am I still aware of sin and weakness and failures? Yes. How do I perceive myself? Yes, in Adam. But... In Christ alone. In him, I do boast more blessings than my father lost. I remember singing a hymn. We don't sing it at home. We used to sing it in school. Praise to the holiest in the height. Remember that? Thank you for that. And in the depth we praise. In all his words, most wonderful. I never knew what I was singing about. Most sure in all his ways. Oh, loving wisdom. Of our God, when all was sin and shame, a second Adam to the fight and to the rescue came. Oh, wisest love, that flesh and blood which did in Adam fail should strive again against the foe, should strive and should prevail. So we sing, no condemnation, now I dread. Jesus and all in him is mine. Alive in him, my living head. And clothed in righteousness divine. So bold I approach the eternal throne. And claim through grace, through Christ, the crown, through Christ, my own. Only one hope, only one Savior, only one cross, only one act, but what an act.
Because for those who receive him, and it is for those who receive him, I'm not presuming everybody here is a Christian, because he makes it clear to those who receive the abundance of grace, to those who believe, I'm not presuming because you grew up in it, I'm not presuming because you're sitting here, that you are regenerate. You may just be religious. You may just do this. When I go, no condemnation, now I trade. Do you go, yes? Or do you go, eh? If you go, yeah, you're probably not a Christian. You're probably still in Adam. But the offer of eternal life is come to Christ, receive him for yourself. Come to Christ. He will turn away none that come to him. And for those who go, yes, I know, live in the good of it. How do you apply this? Enjoy it. There you go. Points of application. Enjoy it. What do I do with this? Weep over it. Sing over it. Rejoice over it. Glorify the Father who sent the Son by enjoying him. That's why, that's how God, back to Piper, how does God, which it isn't Piper, he stole it from Lewis, who stole it from Edwards, who stole it from Paul, um, who stole it from God. How do we glorify God the most? By enjoying him forever. We're so busy wanting to apply it. Here's my 16 things. I come to a conference. You're at the conference this week. Thanks for coming. I'm going back on holiday. But here's the thing. I can come away from conferences totally overwhelmed at what I've got to do. Totally overwhelmed at where I need to change. And that's not wrong and that's not bad. Just come away totally overwhelmed with Jesus Christ. And you'll do what you've got to do and you'll change where you need to change. Just enjoy him. Amen. Let's pray, then we're going to sing a song because I've gone way too long. Oh, loving wisdom of our God. When all was sin and shame, and that included us, Lord. A second Adam to the fight and to the rescue came. I want to thank you for all of us here who know you. For all of us here who you called, whose death Christ made this for us. Lord, that you looked into the cup of our sin, not just Adam's, but our sin, the whole of the sin for those in the church for whom you died. He saw it. He took it. He drank it, and he did it, and he won it. And now we can reign in life with you. Lord, I pray. I pray that today, maybe someone in this room who doesn't know you today is convicted of sin and turns to you. May that be the case. And for us all, may we be thrilled afresh by who you are and what you have done for us in your beloved son. Thank you. Thank you. He died for me. May we live lives that enjoy this to your glory till we stand before your throne. Amen. Amen. Well, it's appropriate to sing, isn't it? It's appropriate to sing. It's appropriate not just because we do it, but because, not because we must do it, but because we must do it. We're going to end up singing a wonderful old hymn, Sovereign Grace, O'er Sin Abounding. So let's stand to our feet, guys, and sing this together. And then I will pray and send us home. Okay, we got it.
Lord, thank you that grace shall always reign. And when we stand before your throne, there will be shouts of grace, grace to it. When we see who you are, when we get a glimpse and we, are, we know even as we have been known, even more so of what you have done, of the scars that you will bear forever, and the glory of the Lamb who was slain for us. We love to consider that day when we will meet you face to face. But till then, may we rejoice with an everlasting joy of the glories of Calvary that have been wrought for us by your wonderful, glorious Son. Thank you, Lord Jesus. And Jude says, Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you blameless before the presence of his glory with great joy to the only God, our Savior, through Jesus Christ, our Lord, be glory, majesty, dominion and authority before all time and now and forever. Amen. Amen. Have a wonderful, glorious week, my friends. Amen.